Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Kyle Horton, who is an assistant professor at Colorado State University in the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology. Kyle received his bachelor's degree in biology from Canisius College in 2011. He completed his master's in wildlife ecology at the University of Delaware in 2013, and his PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Oklahoma in 2017. Uh, Kyle's lab works to weave together a range of tools and approaches, including the use of radar, community science data, and field studies to address conservation challenges. Using these tools, Kyle's aeroecology lab broadly addresses questions related to bird migration and their use of airspace. Uh, with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kyle Horton. Thanks everyone for coming out. Really appreciate the invite to chat about some of the work. My lab, collaborators, students in my lab, postdocs, et cetera. Uh, the stuff I'll be showing is, is not just me doing this work, right? So sharing it with, with sort of a community of folks at, at CSU and other institutions that I've been in uh, and at across probably the last decade or so. Um, so let's see, just based on some of the remarks, if you go on YouTube and you check out the bird call sort of karaoke, there may be a video of myself and Carolyn dancing as Western Greaves on the stage of the lyric. There might be, there might not be, just, just saying. Um, it was a blast. I highly encourage everyone to go, have kind of fun to go to that fundraising event. Um, okay, so I'm going to try to get through a number of slides. Hopefully I'll stick to a timeline around talk of 50 minutes or so. Um, my goal is to try to convince you of some of my objectives here of, of talking about bird migration, talking about aeroecology. That term will make sense, I think, in a little bit if it doesn't already. Um, and then just sort of show how we can use radar to quantify the movement of migratory birds. Before I get there, I'll just give a little bit of my background. Um, and hopefully there'll be a bunch of time for questions at the end. Um, I'd be If there's a question that like you can't wait, until the 50 minutes are over. You could just, you can call it out if you need to, that's okay. Um, but for me to stay on the timeline of 50 minutes, I'll maybe hold the questions to the end and then I'll take as many as I can with however long you wanna stay here. Uh, questions are the, the most fun. Okay, um, so real quick, let's see if this will work. What's this guy? There we go. Okay. All right, so a little bit of my background. I grew up in Western New York, around Buffalo, New York. I started uh, getting into bird watching and doing the science of birds, ornithology. Started with bird banding as an undergrad. Um, I got really excited about this. I was learning birds, but then learning ornithology at the same time. And this was just a super exciting time for me. Getting to see a lot of really interesting species like short-eared owl, which is actually an, a locally endangered species in New York State. Uh, we'd stay out all night and try to capture one, put a tag on it, a radio telemetry. Um, I did acoustic work on flight calls with migratory birds. Um, this was a ton of fun. Um, that's a magnolia warbler shooting out of our acoustic chamber there. Um, and again, we, we balanced between doing acoustic data, but then trying to travel me selfishly going to places where I'd get a new life bird, like a big Nell's thrush in that previous photo, um, to doing my PhD on radar work. Um, every, every boy's dream to land on the cover of the Norman, Oklahoma, Norman, Oklahoma newspaper here. Um, so I made it. I peaked as a PhD student. It's all downhill from here, right? Um, but no, really exciting time uh, for my PhD, working on radar data to quantify the movement of migratory birds. And that'll be the basis of today's talk, talking about some of that work, but a lot that's happened in between. So, okay. let's see. Okay, so I think migratory birds are just fascinating. We probably all do too as birders, right? Spring, fall really uh, can be energizing. And I think it's just fascinating thinking about the habitats that migratory birds will pass through on a, on a given year, right? So we can go to 
the sand dunes in California, maybe see burrowing owls, right? They're quite plentiful in these regions to going to northern latitudes like Alaska, right? And seeing where the many of these migratory birds actually end up. Um, and studying migratory birds is, is taking me to all of these locations, you know, since my entry into ornithology. Um, whether it's seeing a, a rose-breasted grosbeak that's just across the Gulf of Mexico and I could stand five feet away from it because it's so exhausted from flying 24 hours that all it can do is, is get enough insects to replenish those energy stores. Um, or small birds like blue-gray gnat catchers uh, and the great you know, diversity of birds that we might see in Southern Texas, like a kiskadee or scarlet tanager showing up freshly across the Gulf of Mexico um, to something like a chestnut-sided warbler. Um, I'm very warbler-centric coming from the East Coast and then coming to Colorado. The warbler diversity is not so great. Um, so I pepper in as many warblers as I can here. Um, I remember taking this photo um, at Black Swamp Observatory or McGee Marsh on the coast of Lake Erie in Ohio, um, having that bird sort of do that pose and then the shutter clicks and did I get it, did I not? And I was happy to get it. Um, usually they don't look that good. Um, or, you know, things like these cryptic species or a local migration phenomena that we have here with sandhill cranes in Colorado or going to Nebraska. Um, to see these awesome birds and just the diversity that we have uh, in North America. When I was reading, getting into ornithology, I would read all about Arctic tern as this, this sort of uber migrant that would go from Alaska all the way to the southern reaches of the southern hemisphere, covering tens of thousands of kilometers sometimes in a given year, right, doing these figure eight patterns. Uh, and then getting to actually see this, this mega migrant uh, up in Alaska is sort of, you know, this fulfillment of, of studying migratory birds for the last decade or so. So hopefully you're again, excited about birds, excited about migratory birds. And I just show some very basic stats of why I think migratory birds are so fascinating. So this is a black hole warbler. This is a photo I shared for talking about this talk. Um, and this is a photo I took uh, years ago on the coast of Texas. This is very clearly a bird that had just crossed the Gulf of Mexico. When it landed, it probably weighed about 12 grams, right? So 12 grams, I forgot to bring my change tonight. 12 grams is the equivalent of two quarters and a dime. That's 12 grams, right? So if you jump in your car, you've got a little change. Okay, that's a black hole warbler. Um, so this bird's gonna forage and forage and forage and it's gonna build up fat stores and that's gonna be the fuel for migration, right? So when we used to catch these birds at banding stations, you know, right before they'd probably take off to head south or north, depending on the season, they'd weigh about 24 grams, right? So it's just remarkable. If I said, you've got to double your mass in the next week, you probably would no longer be living, right? Um, so this bird is doing this regularly throughout its migration. It's just fascinating. Um, if you need another weight comparison, 24 grams is five quarters. So do that and then think those five quarters can fly 1,200 kilometers across the Gulf of Mexico, flying for 24 to 30 plus hours straight. And I think that's really cool about migratory birds. Um, Again, the Gulf of Mexico has always been this near and dear spot for thinking about birds, going bird watching. Um, being a professor, I don't get to do as much birding as I want. Um, I always tell my students I'd rather be birding 100% of my time, and I often do it about 0% of my time on a daily basis. Um, but we usually do a trip down to Texas to sort of get the birding out of my system for the year. Uh, we go crazy birding for about a week, two weeks, um, and we see as many birds as we can in that time. And we've always had this question of, how many migratory birds are actually moving through the Gulf of Mexico region, right? You could open up a book, and I did this as a grad student, right? I'd open up a paper, and I could sort of guess. I could, you know, nearly chat GPT at that point what the intro of a migration paper would look like, right? It would say hundreds of millions of birds migrate seasonally spring and fall, tens of millions of birds, billions of birds, right? But there's never one a reference to how many, like, what was the number coming from? It was our best guess what we thought could be going on given how many birds we'd be seeing on the ground. So we had this question of, well, how many birds are actually coming through into the US, for instance, coming out of the tropics? 
And we have this tool at our disposal, and I'll just give you a snapshot of what this tool can do uh, in this slide, and then I'll get more into the details of it. But at each one of these white points here sits a radar, and I'll get more into the details of those radars. And we could crunch data across multiple decades, and we could say, okay, this is the distribution of where the most number of birds come through through the Gulf of Mexico. The size of the disks here uh, represent where the most number of birds are coming through. So coastal Texas is where most the most number of birds are coming through. Those are those purple disks, if you can see those. Okay, so that's still not telling us how many birds are coming through. It's a relative indication of where the most number of birds are coming through. So then what we were able to do is think about these radars are like the turnstile of you going into a roller coaster or a merry-ground. Whatever your cup of tea is for your amusement park ride, there's a turnstile that counts how many people come into that ride, right? So we could think of the radars as that turnstile. So a bird flies over, we have a tick, and one more tick, and one more tick, and that tick gets to be a very big number eventually. So from March to June, we were able to quantify how many birds are coming through the Gulf of Mexico region. And what we quantified is something that looks like this. So in the end, across spring migration, we estimate around 2 billion birds coming through this region, right? So just these massive numbers, but now we actually had a method. We had a citation of how many birds are coming through this region. Um, we were able to say with a lot of confidence, when are the birds coming through this region? So about a billion birds will come through that region in a span of just 19 days. So that's really important from a conservation messaging standpoint, right? Whether it's light pollution, which I'll talk about today, or keeping your cats indoors, or if you just want to fill your bird feeders, or if you want to haul wind turbines, having those numbers is really important for messaging to folks on the ground. And then the important part is that we are able to tune these numbers with eBird community science data. So the radars, uh, the first question I always get when I talk about radar, I've learned to nip it in the bud now, is that the radars don't tell us anything about the species moving. But what we can do is take ground-based information to sort of fill in the color of what's going on with migration. I always use this crude analogy of what the radar actually measures. The radar actually measures, you can think of it this way, how much bird meat is in the airspace. It sounds really crass, but that's ultimately what it's giving us. How much meat is in the air? And we have to know how to divide that meat, right? So do we divide that meat by the average size of a Canada goose, snow goose, or a ruby-throated hummingbird? It'll matter dramatically what that final number is based on how big the birds are. And we can use eBird to parameterize that. And that's how we got to that 2 billion uh, bird number. Okay, so for today, I want to go through talking about airspace as habitat. Hopefully, you'll be convinced of that. That we can use radars to measure the movement of migratory birds, that these movements of migratory birds are predictable, uh, and that artificial light is one of the threats to migratory birds as they move north and south, depending on the season. Okay. So really quick, uh, globally, there's about 10,000 plus species of birds around the world. About 20%, 19% of those are considered migratory. Long distance, short distance, altitude, no, about 19%. In North America, again, harsher climate, uh, birds are going to get pushed out during the winters. Uh, they're going to get pulled in from resources in spring and summer. About 70% of birds in North America are considered migratory. The next question we can ask is, when do those birds migrate? Do they migrate during the day? Do they migrate at night? So when we actually go through, do the tally of when these birds are migrating, we actually see about 80% of birds migrate at night. So that's hence the title of the talk, right? This movement that is unseen. We see the birds on the ground after they've landed, after they've migrated, and then they forage, and then they take off at night. We don't see the actual migration very often. So really quick, uh, some advantages, right? Why do these birds migrate at night? Maybe these will be obvious uh, to many of you. There's a bunch of advantages, right? The birds that eat the small birds that migrate, the songbirds are mostly active during the day. So migrating at night allows them to avoid predation from, you know, hawks, um, other birds of prey, falcons, et cetera. 
Um, so that's one advantage. Uh, another one, it's cooler at night, right? So if you wanted to run a race, you'd probably rather run it when it's 70 degrees versus 100 degrees, right? So if you could do that simple strategy, that allows the birds to migrate more efficiently. Uh, and then lastly, the winds tend to be calmer. The atmosphere tends to be calmer at night. And just to visualize that really quick, right? So sun rises, we usually get this pattern of wind intensity. Winds get more intense, getting further from the surface of the earth. As the surface of the earth heats, we get warm air rising. That starts to mix the atmosphere. It pulls some of those more intense winds back down to the surface. We get intensity of winds throughout the day. Um, and then as the sun sets, it's going to cool. That's going to become more laminar, smoother atmosphere. If you're a ruby crown kinglet bouncing through the atmosphere, if you could pick day or night to move through that atmosphere, natural selection, evolution is going to push these birds into migrating at night. So this is going to be one of the dominant reasons of why they do this. Okay, second point on this slide. Um, when we think about migration, where do we actually see migration? When do we see the migratory birds? We usually see them in our favorite birding patch around Fort Collins, Colorado, Texas. We see them on the ground, or we see them in an aquatic environment. But the migration is, is happening here, right? So when we think about this, we think about, okay, migration has to be happening in a habitat. And that habitat is up in the airspace. So the study of these aerial habitats is known as aeroecology, right? So we often, again, don't think about airspace as a habitat. Um, just to frame this sort of in an extreme, um, there are some species that spend the vast majority of the whole year flying. So things like common swift, alpine swift, even some of our chimney swifts. Um, Many of these European swift species spend about 10 months of the year flying. They come back to the ground just to breed, right? So you can't build a nest in the air, uh, but you can fly and forage and sleep uh, and have all the normal behaviors mate in airspaces. And that's what many of these swifts do, right? So to put that in that perspective, right? Does an alpine swift spend 10 months out of the year not in a habitat or airspace must be a habitat, and it's a habitat for some species, and maybe not for others. But for many of these aerial birds like this, and migratory birds, the airspace is the critical habitat that we think about in my lab. Okay, so the tool that we use to quantify migratory birds is this right here. So this golf ball looking thing up on a pedestal is a radar. Uh, you probably have seen these driving around. If you pass an airport, you usually see something like this. Um, inside that ball is a dish, a, a parabolic dish. It's always spinning around, it's sending out radiation and it's listening for that radiation to return. That dish is spinning quite rapidly in there. The dish itself, at least in this radar here, is about 28 feet wide in diameter quite large, uh, and it's spinning very quickly. Um, so this is the tool that we use to quantify the nightly movements of migratory birds. So this is a radar here that's on the University of Oklahoma's campus. So this is one of the radars that I started working with as a graduate student. So what does migration look like from a radar perspective? Maybe you've seen this in textbooks or birding um, sort of books as well. What we're looking at here is the night of April 25th, 2023. So last spring, uh, there is a radar right here in Key West, Florida. Uh, and what we are looking at is this is sunset. The birds take off from all of the keys in Key West and they fly north uh, into Florida. Uh, and then we get this big wave of birds down here of birds taking off from Cuba. And we see those birds showing up in the airspaces. So the light blues, some of the greens are migratory birds. This stuff up here is mostly weather or precipitation. We filter that out through our process. So there's the radar there. Okay, so that is one site across the US. In the US, we have a system of radars just like that. At each one of these white dots sits a NEXRAD radar. I'll tell you what that means in just a second. So every five to 10 minutes, we get new data coming in at every one of these sites and they're all freely accessible and they go back almost two and a half decades now. 
So this is what the data look like in their raw form. So this is the night of April 1st. We can see weather patterns up here. This is precipitation. And then all the other stuff here is, is migratory birds. Uh, we can see very quickly just from this one snapshot, the interaction that birds have with weather patterns, right? So we can see all the migratory birds bottled up behind this front. Once you go north of that front, we don't see the activity of many migratory birds, right? So there's a strong interaction of weather and the movement of migratory birds. Again, birders know that, so they're checking the weather, they're seeing what the winds look like to see if the birds are gonna be in their local patch, for instance. So again, this is one snapshot across the season. It looks something like this. So just from this, you can see sort of these blooms of birds. Those are the birds taking off at sunset, fly through the night and settle through the day. We can see the patterns, mostly weather in North America moves west to east, right? So we see these big bands of precipitation moving, the interactions of the birds. We can zoom into Key West if we want to keep seeing the birds crossing the Caribbean, birds arriving across the Gulf, leaving the Gulf, heading north. Um, so these are sort of some of the peak nights of migration, at least in North America. So this is a tremendous amount of information that shows up in a video like this, right? So this is about a 30 second animation. It probably took me three weeks to make. Um, and by the time you download that much data, you're sitting at about a terabyte of data just for one season to make a 30 second video for a PowerPoint uh, to give to an audience, right? So we do something like this, uh, but we do it across multiple decades. We do it for spring and for fall, uh, and we use a lot more high resolution data, right? So the data set that we're working with gets big very, very quickly. So for a long time, we needed to develop tools to basically do the opposite of what meteorologists do, right? They remove the birds and show you just the weather on the weather channel. We're trying to do the opposite, right? So we try to remove the weather, the garbage for us, and keep all of the bird information. So we developed tools over time um, to try to filter this out. And we have an algorithm called MISNET uh, that's been in collaboration with folks at the University of Massachusetts in computer science. Um, so MISNET is our fun ornithology pun on computer science as well, right? MISNET is a tool that we use to catch birds, um, but the algorithm itself is a convolutional neural network, right? So we get the net part from that, and we get the missed part from the ornithology. Okay, so we can remove that, and then we have an ecological product or an ornithological product. Okay, so just quick background on what these radars look like. From Fort Collins, this is our closest radar. It actually is up in Wyoming and is not the Denver radar. Um, again, just that's how distance works. Um, but nonetheless, um, so this is uh, up in the Cheyenne's radar. Um, so this is one of 143 of those NEXRAD radars. Um, NEXRAD is an acronym. NEXRAD stands for Next Generation Radar. Uh, and then this is one of these goofy things where we have an acronym within an acronym, right? So the radar piece, we use it as a noun these days, but radar itself is also an acronym, right? So radio detection and ranging is another acronym, right? You don't need to spell it out that way, but you can think of sonar, LIDAR in that same context. And then these radars themselves are called WSR 88Ds. So WSR means it's a weather surveillance radar, but we scanning, that's the surveillance part. Uh, the 88 is that these radars were engineered in 1988. They were shortly deployed. The first one started collecting around 1991 in Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, and then the Doppler piece is that D, right? So you often hear on the Weather Channel our Doppler radar, right? So the Doppler is that it tells us inbound and outbound speeds from the radar. And that was new in the early 90s for weather radars. Not to say that Doppler technology was new, but it was new to the NetRed system. Okay, so again, we've got these radars in the lower 48. We have them, uh, we have one in Puerto Rico, seven in Alaska, uh, two in South Korea, four in Hawaii, uh, one in Japan, and one in Guam. 
So the states ones make sense. The other ones you might be scratching your head. Um, those are locations where the U.S. has military bases that they put a weather radar on as well, right? So the one in Japan, South Korea, et cetera. Um, so many of these radars have long time series as well. Again, uh, I haven't updated this in a little while now, but we're at some stations approaching 30 years of data. Okay, so really quick radar classification. What do these radars measure? Um, so it could be weather, like they're designed for, hurricanes, tornadoes, precipitation estimation. They also collect some clutter, right? So high-rise building, a wind turbine will also reflect enough energy back to the radars that it shows up as a strong signal. From the biological standpoint, that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, so bird migration, um, there's a bunch of ways we could dissect that for birds, insects, and bats. So from an ecology standpoint, if the thing flying has water in it, it will reflect radar energy back to the radar. Uh, and then all of these things have a high concentration of water in their bodies. So they strongly reflect the radar signal. And we can see things like Mexican free-tailed bats in Texas coming out of caves or under the bridges from Austin, Texas, for instance. Okay, so what does migration typically look like, right? So if we take radar data, what does it look like on a time series? It's hard to fully understand how migration is happening when I show you the US map of these birds pulsating you know, very quickly across the US, right? So let's just look at a simple time series for one location. So in this case, this is for Houston, Texas, in the Houston, Texas radar for spring of 2022. This axis is bird passage, right? Birds per kilometer per hour. Just think of this as an intensity of migration. And then we're gonna start from start of March to the end of June here, beginning of July. So this is typically what the pattern of migration looks like, right? Again, this probably won't be too surprising that you know, migration starts off slow, birds start coming out of the tropics, we get some burst of activity, and then there's a drop, right? Next night, maybe it's unfavorable conditions to migrate. And then it starts bouncing into peak migration. We get some really big nights of migration and then some lulls maybe directly adjacent from each other. So this pattern of this periodicity is, is sort of important from a conservation standpoint, but also a messaging uh, ecological forecasting standpoint. So for Houston, Texas, for spring of 2022, it took nine nights for 50% of the birds to pass through that region, right? So we're looking at a duration of time about 120 nights took nine nights for just 50% of the birds to come through. So that's sort of a powerful statement. So let's look and see if that pattern makes sense at other parts of the US. So I'll go to Binghamton, New York. Again, the pattern itself is similar. All the nights look different, right? There's probably not one peak night here that directly matches what happened in Houston for the spring of 2022. But in this case, eight nights account for 50% of birds passing through. Again, so there's some pattern here. To go to the Denver radar, again, get whatever this night must, you know, maybe that was really great birding or all the birds left that night, we don't know. Um, but nonetheless, a lot of birds are flying. Uh, it took five nights for 50% of the birds to pass through over the Denver radar. Okay, so this is for three stations uh, for one spring season. We don't wanna sort of you know, write home about that with that limited amount of data. What we wanna do is say, okay, let's look at this across all 143 locations. Let's look at spring and fall. And let's look at all the data we actually have access to about at that time when we did this study, 24 years of data. So what we saw is that most of the nights don't account for much activity. Um, but when we get this similar takeaway, again, across spring and fall, across lots of years, what we see is that it's just about 10% of nights at any station for any year account for more than 50% of birds passing over any given area. It's not to say that those nights are the same year after year. It's not to say that they even happen in a relatively same time period versus Texas versus Colorado versus North Dakota. But at every individual site, this pattern seems to hold. So it's the big bursts of migration and then the lulls are the dominant thing. Okay, so we might have this question, okay, if we have these big nights, 
can we actually try to predict or forecast migration for those big nights? If we could predict those, then we'd have traction for the conservation actions that I mentioned, right? Halting a wind turbine, turning off lights, keeping cats indoors, whatever the flavor of conservation is, this would be important. So can we actually predict when the birds will be flying on a given night? Okay, so this is, uh, and again, this project might be familiar, um, and I'll get to sort of where the products land in the end here, but I'll give you the process of how we might go about trying to forecast bird migration. So no surprise, I'm gonna use radar to try to tackle this because it's a powerful tool for measuring nightly migration, does it at large scales, and we've got lots of data to approach this problem. So we use radar to quantify bird migration, and then we might ask, okay, if we have the radar data, what do we think drives migration, right? So maybe just think through that for 10 seconds before I show you what I think drives migration. All right, see if you get your ideas, okay. So we might think of, okay, what's a good night for migration? So we often think about weather patterns, winds, for instance, right? Are they gonna get a favorable tailwind to head north, head south? Uh, we might think about air temperature. Air temperature might tell us something about a frontal passage. Is it getting cold? Is it getting warm? Mm -hmm. um, so we can add in predictors like this that match up with the radar data, okay? And then we can add lots of predictors these days, right? We have computing power to not just be limited to three variables, but we can use sometimes dozens of variables at this point. So things like barometric pressure or humidity or cloud cover or the amount of visibility uh, in the night in the atmosphere. So we took this approach, we grabbed all these predictors, we linked them up with these radar data. Um, so we call this our, our training data, right? So training is usually a, a statistical computer science lingo, right? But we all do training every day. It might be when we're texting on our phone, right? That it learns how we misspell things to spell it correctly, right? Or the autofill in an email or your favorite channel on your TV, it learns your patterns, right? So what we are trying to do is learn the pattern from radar data that predicts migration. So we learn those associations, we build a model. I won't get into the details of this here, but I'm happy to answer questions later. So these are the two critical steps. If we get to this stage and we're convinced that the model has learned the patterns, uh, we've got it. We've got it in the sense that meteorologists make all of the predictors that we would need to predict migration every single day, right? They make lots of predictions of what the atmosphere will look like. We might gripe about them uh, on a daily basis, right? But Moreover than not, they're, they're quite good at predicting a very complicated process, right? So as long as this is true, then we can add a meteorological forecast. So we turn the forecast of weather into a forecast of bird migration. So that is in a nutshell, the process that we are hoping to do. So this hopefully will convince you that we can do this, right? So we did this. And I'm going to show you that it can be done. So what this is, is a forecast, a bird migration forecast from the night of April 26, 2016. Seems like an odd thing that I would reference a 2016 forecast, right? So what we can do in that we have multiple decades of data, uh, we can do all of the scenarios as if we were making real forecasts and then learn if we make a prediction, how did the model actually perform, right? So we have it all internal, right? We don't have to make a prediction and then wait for the birds to migrate and then see how well the radar measured it, right? So what we can do is train our model, for instance, on all of the data, except for the year of 2016. So we pull out 2016, set it aside, pull in all of the meteorological data, and then we make a prediction and turn it into a bird migration forecast as if we were doing it in real time. So what this map shows is all of the white areas, the yellows are where we're predicting a high amount of bird migration on this night. So again, just a prediction here. What we would wanna do now is see what did the radars actually measure as an independent prediction. So this is what the radars actually measured on that night. So hopefully you can see sort of where the activity is from the radar also aligned where we predicted high migration activity. 
One of the powerful things from these forecasts that we quickly learned is that we can also take the number of birds and try to estimate how many birds are taking flight across the U.S. on a given night. So on this night, we're predicting 241 million birds filling the airspaces across the U.S. So just massive numbers, right? Um, I used to have this stat that I've since forgot, um, but I tried coming up with this analogy, right? Because we can bounce around big numbers like this, and they're hard to ingest in terms of that's a lot of birds, right? That's more birds than all of us combined will ever see in our lifetimes many times over, right? Um, I used to say, if you counted one bird flying over your head, imagine your favorite bird, Blackpool Warbler flew over every second, right? It would probably, I think it would take you like 200 years to count up to, you know, this many millions of birds, right? But all of those are taking off at once, at one night, passing through North America. So that's my long-winded approach to say that's a lot of birds. Um, okay, so again, we did that process. We held out one night. In practice, we did, we held out all of the nights. We made predictions. We do it for 2016, 2017. In 1998, 2000, we do all the years we had access to, always holding out a year making prediction. What we saw is, you know, how much of the information did we actually explain? So this scale is a model or is a metric, a statistical metric of how well does our model do? So this scale only ranges from zero to one. Zero on this scale tells us we do no better than chance at predicting migration. Flip a coin, 100 million, 50 million, doesn't matter, right? We're doing no better than chance. One meaning, perfect forecast. Every night is perfect, right? We never expected that. The meteorologists have errors in their forecast, so we would sort of ingest those errors with our forecast too. But even with all of that, for 2017, we explained around 78% of the variation in the data set. So in ecology, that's awesome. Uh, way better than we ever expected jumping into this project. We did this process time and time again, lots of years over, uh, consistent performance across all of the years. So this is really exciting for us. Okay, so why are these forecasts important? So I'll try to give you my pitch, uh, the time I do have left about why these are important and then how uh, the forecast can be implemented and all of you can look at forecasts on a nightly basis. Okay, so when we're talking about migration, they're migrating at night, we have these grand visions of, of birds migrating under the cover of darkness, using stars to navigate north and south. The reality is that those nighttime skies are quite rare these days, right? Anywhere we go in Fort Collins, even getting out to Pawnee, we can see creeping in of lights, right? Starting to brighten the nighttime sky. So what this map here is a measure from space of a depiction of light pollution coming from the ground, right? So we can see large metropolitan areas like Atlanta and Dallas Fort Worth, so on and so forth, the front range here, right? Um, we can see light pollution. So these birds are migrating over this landscape that is now polluted with lights. And lights have a disorienting effect on migratory birds. So we can use radar data to try to quantify the movement of birds over these airspaces. Uh, this is a depiction of migration aggregated across 24 years to get sort of the big picture of migration. Where are the birds migrating through the US? What are the do dominant signals? What's the dominant timing? Now we're in the fall migration. We can see a big pulse of migrants, more spread out in the fall, so on and so forth. So these birds are migrating over these photo polluted areas, but from this scale, it's hard to say, okay, lights equate to birds being attracted on the landscape. It's really hard to do it at these grand scales. So we wanted to focus into an area that's really photo polluted, uh, and then we had this unique uh, experiment that we could do in this area. So. This scene might look familiar, but we often don't think about Central Park at night looking like this, right? We see it during the day, this awesome urban park. Um, but the birds are arriving to this urban park when it looks something like this. And one night out of the year, just happened this week, um, the lights from the September 11th tribute in light are put on to sort of signify the towers, the lives lost during the terrorist attacks. And then we get these massive towers of light. So, there's a positive spin of this, right? I'm going to give you the pitch that light pollution impacts migratory birds, but there's a positive conservation message uh, from this light source. 
So this is what the lights can look like on a clear night. Uh, you can see these lights from 60 plus miles away. They cast four miles up into the airspace. They're really intense. So this is a photo we took from, we usually uh, go there uh, somewhat regularly to do monitoring at these lights. This is a photo Carolyn and I took uh, last September, looking down from our hotel, looking down onto the lights here. So when we're down in the lights on a good night of migration, it can look like this. So your first glance at this would be, okay, that's a lot of insects. Um, I will assure you that there are insects, but mostly what you are looking at here are warblers. Um, so these are birds coming in and out of the lights. In this case, American red star, yellow warbler, northern perula being the dominant birds showing up on this night. There's lots of them, um, hundreds, thousands of birds being quickly drawn into the lights here. So the positive story here is that monitoring is being done by New York City Audubon. Volunteers come out, they sleep through the night, they do shifts to monitor the lights. If we see a thousand birds caught up in the lights, the lights are turned off for 20 minutes to allow the birds to clear south and then the lights are turned back on, right? So I think that's really encouraging given that probably any September 11th, you check the nighttime news, you'll see the tribute in light. Right? And there's going to be some times when birds are migrating and those lights aren't available to be seen, right? And that's because of birds, right? So I think that's a powerful thing, right? We have this really iconic light source, it's really important to U.S. citizens, Americans, and then we're willing to turn it off for migratory birds. So I think there is a connection that we can have lights out programs be successful. One of the things that was challenging going there, seeing these birds coming in and out, it's chaos, right? The birds are chasing each other, they're coming in and out of the lights. Uh, there's a lot of activity. It's hard to count the number of birds accurately. So what we want to do is use radar to quantify the birds. So tribute and light is here. This is lower Manhattan outlined here. Uh, this is for the night of September 11th, 2015, 10, 12 p.m., okay? The radar scans over, and we estimate around the Tribune line 500 birds. 500 birds is a lot of birds, but it's also probably a good indication of just good migration, right? That many birds being up in the airspace in this area. The thing that I failed to mention is that in this case, when the radar sampled, the lights were already turned on. So they're off at this point. 20 minutes later, we get a new radar scan over the Tribune light. The lights are turned on, and it looks something like this. So in just 20 minutes, we see about 16,000 birds being drawn into the lake. So it's very quick too, and the impact's quite dramatic. It's visual, but it's also showing up on this tool. So we did this study a number of years ago. We looked at all of the on off period of the lights. We looked at seven years of data. Seven years is sort of a goofy metric for this study system because this happens one night out of the year. So it's seven nights of data. We estimated across those seven nights around 1.1 million birds coming in and out of the tribute and light. Right? The benefit here is that with the lights going off, we see very low mortality at this site, sort of tens to dozens uh, of birds dying on a nightly basis. Um, it's not to say that they won't collide somewhere else and we wouldn't see it, but they're not dying directly at the tribute and light. Uh, and that's a benefit of turning the lights off when they, they get too high. So, you know, folks go out um, on mornings, right, volunteers. This is really important in New York City to try to figure out as they do their loops. This is us doing one last year uh, with volunteers from Audubon. of trying to quantify mortality, right, colliding with building, likely due to lights, um, often with some visibility of low cloud ceiling. So this is an oven bird that struck this building here. So trying to figure this out, right, and if we could predict this is a big night of migration, let's dim lights more broadly than just tribute number, more broadly of thinking New York City or Denver or Dallas, Fort Worth, et cetera. So what tools do we actually have to do this action? So what we have is this tool or program called BirdCast. Um, so this is a project in collaboration with my lab here at CSU, University of Massachusetts and the Cornell Lab of Ontology. And what we try to do is make forecasts publicly available, freely accessible on websites, on birdcast.info, you can pull up an app and see these forecasts. And these forecasts look something like this. 
All right. So when you go to the website, you'll see a forward interface of our maps predicting bird migration on a nightly basis. We update these maps four times every day. We make a forecast for tonight, tomorrow, and the night after. And they just keep rolling through the season, new predictions every night. So this is the forecast for tonight from uh, night of September 14th, 2023. Um, so this is for tonight, tomorrow, and the night after. We also create lights out alerts. Um, so the lights out alerts, you can think of these maps are a uh, abundance prediction. A lights out alert is a relative prediction of high intensity or low intensity. Is it high migration in Colorado? Is it high migration in Texas? And those scales would look different, but if we put them on the same relative scale, we could say it's both high or it's both low. And those maps look something like this. So we also make lights out alert maps. So any area in red is an area that we are predicting to be one of those 10 nights for a season that 50% of birds will pass through a given area. So this is the lights out alert for tonight, tomorrow, and the night after. We're now in peak migration. So lots of the US is red with peak migration and a lights out alert. Um, and this is sort of the summary of those nights. So tonight we're predicting around 363 million birds forecast to be moving. Two nights from now, or around 429 million birds, right? Um, so just tremendous numbers of birds migrating across the US. Um, we make forecasts at state levels as well. Um, so you can go to our website, you can see our predictions for tonight, for the state of Colorado, you can see how many birds we might be predicting to fly over various cities, Colorado Springs, Denver, Fort Collins, et cetera. We've also tried getting these into the hands of meteorologists, right? We're using tools that they're also using, right? They're interested in what can be done. Um, so we've had meteorologists cover these on the news. This is from a, a forecast of meteorologist uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, covering our lights out alerts. Um, so let's see, where are we at time-wise? I, I can do it in five. <laughs> okay, I know it's five because I'm gonna try to show a video that's five minutes long, um, but I'm not sure how to navigate the audio with this. Any thoughts? I could just play it through my computer and it might be loud enough or I could bring the microphone over. Maybe that's. Yeah. So for the webcast, the mic is in there. Okay. And for the people in the audience, we can just see it. It's loud. Let's see if it's loud enough. Okay. Every fall and spring, billions of birds migrate through the airspace in the Western Hemisphere. A majority of these birds make this journey under the cover of darkness. Now, these birds face a variety of threats from climate change to land use change, but because they're migrating at night, one of the largest concerns that we want to address is the impact of light pollution on these birds. One thing we've noticed is that folks don't really understand how far light can travel. So some of the impacts in our national parks are in wilderness areas or in pristine, otherwise natural areas. But we see light pollution coming from hundreds of miles away. Oftentimes where that light is coming from, people don't even realize that that could be impacting a natural area, could be impacting wildlife or ecosystems, or even affecting the views for, for the public. Convergence research is a different way of attacking a difficult social problem, social environmental problem in our case, where there's no single discipline that sort of owns the problem or can figure out how to solve it. And so you need to have deep interdisciplinary integration among people with very different disciplinary expertise. And those people have to come together sort of at the beginning of the problem, at the beginning of the project, to try to figure out a pathway to solving that problem. And it involves not just academics, but stakeholders from those communities as well. To work on that problem, both on the social side, and in our case, on the environmental side, to try to understand how we can, in our case, reduce collisions with birds. With them. One thing that's really great about this collaborative convergence research is to bring different subject matter experts together to talk about common problems, common solutions, and find that common ground. 
And one thing we're really excited about too is to not only um, talk with researchers who are concerned about artificial light at night, but also talk with lighting industry and lighting designers and a lot of other stakeholders who are involved with light at night lighting to bring them into the, the fold as well. At Georgia Audubon, we're trying to build places where birds and people thrive. And so with that motto, I'm doing everything from habitat restoration to community science and engagement, anything I can to make our cities more bird friendly. And a big component of that is you know, light reduction and bird building coaches. I think what's most energizing and gives me hope about dealing with light reduction and bird building collisions is that there are tangible steps and information we can give to people to actually make their homes safer and their city safer. There's lots of overlap with these things with you know green cities and sustainability plans for buildings and even safety. There's so much of overlaps with this that there have to be ways for this to catch on and for us to educate and get people excited and understand the importance of it. It's not something that's too foreign to them. And it just feels like there's a lot of momentum around the built environment and, and green cities and how it can coexist with a lot of that. Well, I think it's very important for us as we try to do this new type of convergence research, right? So it really depends on the stakeholders being engaged. Listening to them and learning from them about what they need and what value they can take away from the work that we do. The natural night sky is a resource that is always there. And that is something that is not true of other environmental resources. water quality, things like that. The natural night sky is outside of the realm of Earth, and it is constantly shining. It's a constantly bright. And so what we like to say is that it is always there. We have that baseline to work towards, and that is a, a luxury and a really great benefit of working in this field. And so we love like to communicate with folks when we're talking about like this, this is a problem that we can solve. And if we can use the latest technology and best practices, those stars and that Milky Way and some of those resources will come back to us. They'll shine through and we'll be able to recover that resource. That is a great, great benefit of, of working in this field is that we have natural resource to, to come back to and that's always there. Curious. Um, thank you, Dr. Horton. We have plenty of time for Q and A. Um, people on Zoom, if you have questions for Dr. Horton, you can type them into the chat window here in the in the room. Just raise your hand. We'll try to get through as many of them as we can. Um, but we do want to clear out by nine o'clock. I'm just going to interject with one quick announcement while I have the microphone. Um, that's just to let people know about next month's program. Um, and next month, our guest speaker will be uh, noted Colorado Authority, Stephen Jones. Um, and Stephen is going to be talking about uh, 38 years of continuity, change, and wonder at Sand Hills Wildlife Area. The date is the second Thursday, so next month that'll be October 12th. Stephen Jones of Sand Hills Wildlife Area. With that, um, we'll allow Q&A for up to about 20 minutes. Um, raise your hand if you'd like to ask Dr. Horton a question. The issue of the data, who has any one year database to provide you to look at climate change and further produce climate change? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so the question was in regard to we've got this long radar time period. We can start to look at how, how are things changing across time as well with regard to climate change. Um, so one of the things we think about a lot with climate change and bird migration is, is how is the timing of migration changing in these data as well. Um, we did a study uh, a few years ago now that we looked at how is the timing of spring migration and fall migration changed across that time series? And has it changed under as a predictor of temperature changes, things get warmer. Um, what we found is that spring and fall migration were both advancing. 
Um, and I always think, and the numbers aren't, you know, eye popping in any way. They're not. Um, they're not shifting weeks uh, across these decades. They're sort of a day or two in advance, right? Um, pretty prominent to us. So we could push a cruise liner by swimming behind. Yeah, right. If we moved it at all, good we are at, right? Um, so if we're pushing the distribution of all North American birds in one direction earlier by a couple of days, that, that's pretty dramatic in terms of what's happening relative to climate change. Um, we've also looked at a colleague at uh, the Parnell Lab of Ornithology that did a study of looking at how is the abundance of these birds in these data changed across this time series. Um, in the eastern part of the U.S., there's been pretty dramatic declines showing up in the radar signal as well. Um, less so sort of towards the western U.S., but the eastern part of the U.S. Uh, showed really dramatic declines in bird population for migratory birds from the radar group. Does that help answer the question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So always, insects are always the sometimes the missing link here. The radars quantify insects, but they, they do it somewhat poorly and they get masked likely by the, the strong reflectors of birds. Um, so the insect data are a great thing that we're always sort of chasing and what's the right data set to quantify what the birds are eating. That, that's harder. Question here? Well, you should, okay. But I want to uh, why are we sure that most of the birds are putting their DNA in the face? And the eyes that we can use to eliminate less effective and we use the other one that is far too low, uh, the number of the next thing we can do is not a simple one. Yeah, right. So um, I always sort of make this claim, right? The lights themselves don't kill the birds. Um, the structures around the lights tend to be the thing killing the birds, right? So lights on a communication tower draw the birds into the communication tower. They fly to the tower or the wires supporting the tower, right? It's not the lights killing the birds, it's the structure. Same is true with birds that collide early in the morning at night or fighting with windows. The lights pull them in, they attract, and then they collide with this, this obstacle that they didn't perceive. Um, a lot of collisions are not happening because of lights or at night. They're happening during the day, and there's lots of things we can do to prevent those, whether it's in the city, rural, urban, doesn't matter. Um, there's decals we can put on. The silhouettes that we often see are sort of the science suggests that, that those aren't great at preventing collisions, right? Um, the best practices are usually putting um, some gridded like pattern, sort of an etched glass, dots, small dots, either in a two by two inch pattern, two by four inch pattern um, that covers the glass. Reflective glass is going to be a lot harder for a bird to perceive, right? It sees the reflection of a tree, flies towards that tree, and hits the wind, right? So if we can break up the reflection, that's a big benefit. If we can think about just the context of how we are having uh, vegetation around buildings can help, right? If there's a long corridor of trees, and at the end of that corridor is a window, the bird follows the corridor, and then we're sort of leading it into the collision, right? Um, so can we break up that in any way? Is there some smart way of organizing the structure of vegetation that can prevent it? So those are things. There's other cheaper options, right? We, we have these um, they're called Atopia bird savers, right? They're just strings with usually like a weight or a washer at the bottom. You have the string at the top of your window and drop it down with a little weight to make sure it's a nice leading line, right? And then the bird perceives it, breaks up the glass, right? So you have a just a row of ropes. Again, that's, I would say, of the things we could do, that one's sort of the least aesthetic that we could do, but it's cheap, right? We could do it for five bucks, 10 bucks, and we do lots of windows, as much rope as we can buy. Um, the dots on the windows can be a, a bit more expensive. Um, for doing houses, it would be manageable. 
doing a university building can sometimes you know get into the hundreds of thousands of dollars for retrofitting glass to a brick building. Yeah. Good question. Other questions? Yeah. Um, you said when you're um, comparing the radar data with like a lot of atmospheric variables. Uh, is there a particular or a particular atmospheric variable that would sway less likely to be forecast? Yeah, so the question was you know, of the variables that I showed that we might think uh, predict migration or that we use in our model, which ones drive migration sort of the strongest? Um, when we do this, um, there's some variables that are not atmospheric that are really important. Just the day of the year is really important, right? I can predict with high confidence that there will be more birds migrating in late April than there will be in January, right? So we can sort of let the model learn that pattern. It learns it very quickly. Um, one of the strongest predictors atmospherically is air temperature. So air temperature is, is probably wrapped up a little bit with date, time of the year, um, but it also usually relates to like a frontal passage, right? Get cooler, Temperatures during a frontal passage, that's going to help or hurt migration depending on the season. So air temperature is a really strong predictor. And then maybe to no surprise, winds in the north-south direction are really important for predicting migration. Is it favorable for that bird to migrate north on this night? Those variables show up really strongly. Um, and we've done other studies where we started using atmospheric data near and far. We've included uh, land cover now, uh, light pollution. So we've got lots more predictors that we can look at. So those are usually the dominant temperature, wind speed, and direction. Good question. Yep. Is there a way to um, to encourage the first some kind of method to get new strategies to have these um, earth safe um, windows and go into it all day. Yeah, right. So that's a great question. Um, there are. There's some good cities that are good representation of this. Um, so New York City, oddly enough, is one that's, that's sort of leading the charge on this. Uh, they had legislation that passed two years ago now, maybe a year ago, um, that was sort of new construction would have to have some of these pieces implemented for reducing collisions. So lower reflected glass, uh, maybe the dots on glass, but it was for new buildings being built. Um, There's some pieces on lights as well in the legislation. Um, there was one, they had they put three bills up, two passed and one did not. I think the third one that didn't pass was for reducing lights on exterior, the exterior of buildings. And it would seem odd that like, yeah, that's the one we want to focus on. Um, but lights inside the buildings are quite important too. We actually saw, we did a study in Chicago where we looked at just the amount of lights coming from the inside of the building to the outside. And that was strongly, strongly predictive of bird collisions. Um, so it's not just the lights that are, you know, lighting up the facade of the building, it's also the lights inside. And that makes sense, right? The birds are colliding with the windows, they're flying towards the light, and in between the light is a window. Uh, so in that case, the interior lights can be important. That one, I believe, passed in New York City. So there are some good examples out there like that. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Yep. Yeah, so the question was, um, are we seeing any impacts of smoke on migration? Um, from our studies, we haven't really jumped into this that thoroughly, um, mostly because it's really hard. Um, and it's hard in that uh, when there's a wildfire, all that uh, debris goes up into the atmosphere and it gets also detected by the radars. Um, so we now have all of this ash in the atmosphere and then maybe the birds are in the ash but it's hard to disentangle those from the signals um there was a recent study not uh, part of my group um but they were tracking i want to forget the species i want to say snow goose but my head saying probably was not snow geese um but they put transmit they had transmitters on four geese in the western u.s um by coincidence there was wildfires when the birds took off. 
Um, and they had tracked these birds previously, and they took a dramatic detour around the areas that were impacted by smoke and wildfire, um, to the extent that they were sort of going like hundreds to near thousands of kilometers further to avoid this plume of smoke that they're migrating through. Um, and those studies are just hard, right? Like, how can we put transmitters out and then predict that there's going to be a wildfire and then quantify that, right? So this was one of these happenstance studies that provides some of the best evidence. Um, and that evidence will keep building as fire frequency increases, unfortunately. But it does seem to be affecting you know, some birds as well. Yep. Um, I noticed you used gen turf for the NICE lab radar uh -huh. instead of the Cheyenne. Um, have you ever used both of them to see if the transmutation is come back from Cheyenne to Denver? And over the years, um, because I've been involved with the practices of fracking sure. and what's happened to our environment. And so I'm wondering. If there's been a higher incidence of deaths and births because of the benzene and all of that in the air, or if the birds are changing, like if they go around the smoke, sure. if they have picked up the dangerous things around the tracking, and if you see any patterns, like say if you're looking between say Cheyenne and Denver, mm -hmm. if you've seen any shift. In the migratory patterns, yeah, because of the mm -hmm. high incidence of the factors. Yeah, I can't. Uh, the question was sort of looking at the two local radars, at least in this area, Denver and the Cheyenne radar, um, as we're seeing one any changes or evidence of environmental pollutants showing up and affecting bird migration. Um, at least in the work we've done, one, we haven't sort of zoomed into those two stations explicitly to test anything there. Um, without having done it, it's hard for me to speculate on what we could see or if we would see anything. Um, I always buffer questions like this where like the radars produce very messy data for what we do. Um, so really granular questions that are you know, sometimes the most important, sometimes radar is not the right tool for us to be answering those questions. Um, and I'll just sort of use this as an example. When we did the tribute and light work in New York City, um, I was uh, skeptical it would ever work because it was really granular in terms of what we were trying to do. We're trying to look at pixels over a small area uh, and then try to see as the lights go on and off, could we actually detect that in the radar? And the radar was really far away from that site. Um, I was very quickly convinced as soon as I started processing the data, it was it was so stark in terms of those opposing images. Um, so it's sometimes possible to see granular things in the radar data, um, but I just don't know the sort of local context of what could be changing. But it's a good question. Too. Yeah, you have to look over. You know, the beginning of when the tracking was, yeah. See if you see any adjustments right. like from the birds flying patterns, or if you see any more deaths without running the middle from this poison. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, sorry, I don't have a good answer for it. <laughs> any other questions? Any online? Yeah, I'll make an observation. Yeah, sure. Um, the WSR PDDP came out of Buffalo in 1988. <clears throat> they replaced the WSR 57s, which came out in 1957. That's a 30 year re refresh cycle of the technology. Uh, we're about to implement the refresh cycle. I know the Northern Engine Fund would pay for ways. And um, we don't know. Yeah, I'm like, I'm sort of on the fence. Uh, I do hope it'll change, but I don't want it to change so fast that I have to change everything we do. <laughs> uh, but that's the right technology, right? That's sort of the, the tracking direction, right? In many ways, the next rad is like, it's well lived out its lifespan. Uh, and they've made updates with like dual pull recent, you know, last 10 years. Um, but phased array would give us so much more. Phased array is, is a radar that often does not have to scan like uh, next red radar with the parabolic dish. It's uh, oh, no yeah, it's all electronic. Um, it's usually flat boards of sort of you know things that create radiation. Um, can be steered electronically, and it samples very very quickly. Um, so you can get updates. You know when we get updates at five minutes, being the fastest, you probably get one minute update, two minute updates. But 
Um, about 10 years ago, they had a polarization diversity. Is that useful to your project? It is, yeah. So, um, yeah, good. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. This will get in the radar weeds very quickly. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the question was next right updated their radars in 2013 to what's called um, polarimetric radar, so dual polarization. All prior to that, it was a single polarization. Those details don't matter. Nonetheless, they upgraded them. Um, they create new data products, um, and we have used those. Um, one of the products that we use is correlation coefficient. Um, it's usually used for discriminating rain from other things. Um, but what we can do is remove the rain very easily now uh, with this new data product. Uh, what we did with this, which is really important, is we used it to train our algorithm for separating rain and precipitation, that MISNET algorithm. We needed to create our own algorithm that didn't rely on these new data so we could go back to the 90s to filter our data. We can use the new data, but we only can go back to 2013 with those data. We use the dual pool data to build this framework so we can jump back into the 90s or early 2000s. But yeah, that's a really good question. I'm really good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. One more. Okay. <laughs> any others? Is there any online? There's one that I meant to write down. Okay. 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 Yeah, I didn't mention this on Birdcast. You can sign up in lots of areas for alerts uh, to get a, an email alert as well for those nights that were predicting really high intensity migration. So trying to get toward that. All right. Well, if there's no others, I can stick around for a couple minutes. But thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for for Stephen Jones's presentation. Have Thanks for the way questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs>